everyone, welcome back. We're used to the idea of political correctness these days. There are some things that it's not politically correct to say, such as your religion is wrong, or your use of pornography or your lifestyle is, should not, is not something that you should do, or even to tell someone that God is going to judge their sin. People think these subjects or these comments just ought not to be opened up in conversation. Well, God is not worried about being politically correct. In this passage, he opens up the subject of the harvest for judgment again, and it's not pretty. He opens up the subject of sexual morality and truthfulness and the products of a life lived for him, and he does not give a snap of his fingers for how people feel about hearing these subjects. We're looking at chapter 14 of Revelation, and it's a chapter of contrasts. I'm going to try and point out some of them as we go through. The chapter begins with a beautiful sight. The lamb is standing on Mount Zion and the 144,000 are with him. Now, we, we know who the lamb is. This is Jesus. This is the most commonly used name for Jesus in the book. It is symbolic of his suffering and sacrifice, but also of his victory. And here he is standing as a ram at the height of his power. You might wanna know where Mount Zion is. Well, Mount Zion was originally tied to the Jebusite fortress that David captured when he conquered what is now known as the city of Jerusalem. Eventually, the name became connected with the um, whole of the city of Jerusalem and specifically with the Temple Mount, which was very, very close to where the original fortress had been. And then it became tied to the concept or the idea of God dwelling among his people. So it's often used in conjunction with the coming reign of the Messiah and with the people of God. So it's used of a physical place, but it's also used of the idea of God's reign among his people who follow him. It's even used sometimes to refer to heaven. Now it's unclear here if John is seeing the city of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, or the heavenly Jerusalem, but the reign and the power of the Lamb is the central idea of this vision. And so this is another picture of Jesus in his power and authority. The 144,000 we have encountered before. Remember that they were there were very different possibilities as to who these were. One is that they are Jews who have believed in Jesus during the tribulation. And you will recall from chapter 7 that they were sealed with the mark of protection and ownership for they belong to God. This may then be a literal group of 144,000 Jews. Another possibility was that the number was representative of the whole of believers. That 12 squared is representing perfect completeness. Some think that these are all believers of all time um, together. Now it doesn't really matter in terms of what's being portrayed here. There is a contrast being set up between two groups, those who belong to God and those who belong to the beast. This group standing on Mount Zion is described. They have two names on their foreheads, the name of God and the name of the Lamb, and they are singing. The song is exuberant, loud, likened to peals of thunder and rushing water. And it says it's a new song. Now, new songs in scripture refer to the response of people to a new work of God. This group has been redeemed from the earth. So this is a redemption song. You know, each of us has a unique story about how we came to God. And the history of God's work in mankind has unique periods of time. These, if they are redeemed from the earth during the tribulation, have a unique experience and are saved in a very unusual and difficult time. And theirs is a new song. And they are further described in chapter 14, verses 4 to 5. These, these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They were blameless. Now these verses can be a little bit confusing on the surface. It is not saying that these people are physical virgins. Rather, sexual purity is being used as a picture of spiritual purity. 
In the Old Testament, God often used adultery as a description of spiritual unfaithfulness. So this is saying that these people are faithful to God. They have not denied their faith. They have, not, they have held to their testimony of Jesus, even in the face of death. And they follow the lamb wherever he goes. This is a picture of dedicated discipleship. They are purchased from among men and offered to God. And that's the idea of first fruits and ties to the concept of being living sacrifices. They are living for God, laying down their own will, even perhaps to the point of death. And even their integrity is, then is mentioned. There is no lie in their mouths. They're truthful. They speak the truth. They're not deceptive. And finally, they are blameless. This is about their moral integrity in action. This group stands with the Lamb on Mount Zion. This is a picture that is tied to the writings in the writings of the prophets to the concept of the victorious reign of Christ. So they stand in victory. They stand with the victorious Lamb. Suffering has been present in their lives. They have maybe even been martyred, but there is victory. You have to love how God intersperses these views of suffering and struggle for his people with the promise of assured victory. He scatters hope throughout the passages. Now, as a side note in the Bible, hope is not wishful thinking. It's not like saying, I hope I get a 15 karat diamond ring for my birthday. It's a confident, instead, it's a confident expectation of something that is a sure thing, but has not yet come. It's something we're anticipating, but something that is for sure going to happen. Our hope in biblical terms is as solid as the throne of God. In contrast to this view of hope and victory, in verse 6, we switch back to judgment, and it says, John saw another angel. Now, the word another is not in relation to the lamb on Mount Zion, but to the angels that were seen in the previous chapter, chapter 13. This angel has the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, and he's calling again for repentance. God is again offering mercy, even as judgment escalates. The angel calls for people to fear God and to give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, he says, the sea and the springs of water. There's a chance to repent and accept the eternal gospel. The gospel is the truth that through the death of Jesus, a plan that was established before the world was even made, by any person who accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior, they can be saved from the judgment that will fall on the unbelieving world. Now the second angel follows, shouting, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the Great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. So what or where is Babylon? Is this a literal city, or does this represent the system of the world that opposes God? If it's a literal city, is it the capital city of the kingdom ruled by the Antichrist? Will it be in the location of the former Babylon? Or is it a city that is called Babylon as symbolic of the character of this city or kingdom? Well, it's impossible to know which of these it is. The Babylon of the Bible was the opulent capital of the nation that invaded and enslaved Israel. It was pagan and it represented the evil and adulterous opposition to the people of God. Whatever this Babylon might be, it's going to be defeated. It will be unable to stand before the power of the Lamb. In this chapter, this is the first of the contrasts. Mount Zion stands in contrast to Babylon. Mount Zion is a picture of victory, but Babylon is seen as falling, as defeated. Verse 8 also mentions another contrast. Babylon is tied to adultery. Now again, this is likely not simply sexual, physical adultery, but spiritual apostasy, rejection of God, unfaithfulness to him. It is the worship of anything or anyone other than God. In this time period that is in view here, it will be worship of the beast. The third angel follows and he says that if anyone worships the beast and accepts his mark, he will drink the wine of God's fury, which is poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. This person is, that person is going to be tormented forever with burning sulfur. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever. There will be no rest for those who accept the mark of the beast. For those who follow the lamb, 
receiving, they receive victory and those who follow the beast are led to destruction. Those who follow the lamb sing a song of redemption. Those who follow the beast get eternal torment. Those who follow the lamb have rest and those who follow the beast have none. Those who follow the beast drink this maddening wine of adultery. Now that's a pretty graphic picture. Wine can be pleasurable and enjoyable to drink, but what is offered in this city is going to draw people to madness. Now I doubt it means literal insanity, but rather the wrong thinking and false beliefs that lead to corrupt and evil behavior. The cup of God's wrath is the same cup Jesus drank at the cross. He took on the wrath of God over sin and bore the punishment. But for those who do not accept Jesus, the cup is still full and it must be poured out. It must be drunk by those who are still under judgment. Verse 12 says something we have heard before. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's, God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then there is a promise that those who die in the Lord are blessed. The idea of dying in the Lord is not necessarily dying by martyrdom. It means dying having lived faithfully and living faithfully to the end. In this period of time that is being described here, it's going to be easier to follow the ways and thinking of the world. There will be less cost in the immediate moment. But we have to keep the end in view. Those who faithfully follow Jesus in patience and endurance will be victorious. Those who take the easy way out in the moment will get eternal torment. Again, a contrast. Torment is contrasted with the rest of those who are faithful to the Lamb. And now we have a harvest scene beginning in verse 14 with two distinct harvests. And there are a couple of different opinions about this passage, as is typical in Revelation, so let's go through it. John sees someone on a white cloud, and the one he sees was one like the Son of Man. Now that description reminds us of two things from other parts of Scripture. First is the passage in Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel sees someone like the Son of Man, who is given authority by the Ancient of Days and given a kingdom that will not end. This is the Messiah and his eternal reign is in view. The other thing that comes to mind is that the name, the Son of Man, is a name Jesus used over and over of himself throughout his time on earth. So this one who is seated on the cloud is Jesus. He has a crown on his head and a sickle in his hand. An angel comes to him and says, take your sickle and reap, for the time to reap has come, for the harvest of earth is ripe. Now, it might look as if the angel is telling Jesus what to do, commanding him, but that's not the case. Angels are messengers. So this angel is likely carrying a message from God the Father to the Son, telling him this is the time. So it's Jesus who reaps. He swings the sickle and harvests. And then the other, another angel comes, and he too has a sickle. And he's commanded to take his sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth vine because they are ripe. He does so, gathering the grapes and throwing them into the wine press of God's wrath. Now these two harvests can be interpreted in two ways. One way is to see the first harvest as being that of believers, the gathering in of those who are followers of Jesus. And then the second harvest of the grapes, which is clearly for judgment, because it says that they are cast into the wine press of the wrath of God would be the judgment or the harvest of unbelievers. Now this is similar to what we would read in Matthew 13, 24 to 30, in which there is the parable of the wheat and the weeds that are harvested together, and the wheat is gathered into the barns and the weeds are burned. So it may be symbolic of the separation of believers and unbelievers in one harvest event. The other possible interpretation is that both of these harvest scenes are the same event the harvest of judgment. There are very similar passages in the Old Testament, such as Joel chapter 3, verse 13, that says, Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, for the wine press is full, and the vats overflow, so great is their wickedness. If these are both symbolic of the harvest for judgment, then the doubling of the vision, showing it twice, is symbolic of its severity. 
The severity is emphasized in the final verse of the chapter. It says they are trampled in the wine press outside the city and blood flows out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles and for a distance, the 1600 stadia. Now that would be a flood of blood five feet deep and 300 kilometers long. This is very horrific and graphic picture. It's likely that this is not literal. Rather, it is hyperbole for the sake of emphasis. The judgment will be horrible, overwhelming, huge. God is using this picture to show us just how dreadful it is to ignore his offer of mercy through the eternal gospel. Now, this chapter is still in sort of this interlude section in which we have stepped out from looking at events from a human perspective and are seeing characters and plans from heaven's perspective. We're going to return to earthly events in the next chapters. The harvest is close. The harvest for judgment, or whichever way you look at the harvest, um, it's close and so close that God sees it as done. It's a sure thing. Nothing can stop it from happening. God often portrays things as done that have not yet happened because his plans are so certain. For example, um, the saying that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He was not slain before the foundation of the world. He was slain partway through human history, now 2,000 years ago on a cross in Jerusalem. But the idea is the plan was a done deal. It was so certain that it was going to happen that God saw it as done before he even created the world. And it's this, it could be the same idea here. It probably is that this harvest is such a certain thing that God is showing it as done, even though we haven't yet finished the events that lead up to it. Now, no matter how you see these first two harvest scenes, the harvest for judgment is really terrible. Judgment is a difficult subject and we have a hard time accepting the reality of it from God. So in the next um, lesson, we're going to be in Revelation again, but the one after that, we're going to be stepping out from Revelation to look at the subject of judgment and mercy from God. In this passage, we have again seen the offer of the eternal gospel to all of the world as judgment approaches. God is holy and just, and the price of sin is high, but his mercy endures to the end. It is also our response to the eternal gospel that determines which of these groups we belong to, either the one standing in victory on Mount Zion or the one following the beast to destruction. The presentation of the gospel is described between the description of these two groups. It is our response to the gospel that divides humanity into two groups, those who believe and have victory and those who do not and are judged. For those who believe, there is a momentary cost for obedience to Jesus, but that vast and horrific judgment is avoided. Those people sing a song of victory and joy on Mount Zion, standing beside the reigning lamb. I love how God gives us these pictures of hope and victory to help us endure the cost of obedience and the horror of judgment. Our victory, our redemption, is an act of God's grace. We have received so much and so much more is waiting for us. What song of praise for your redemption are you singing today?